the accent that you hear is a Canadian accent. I came over here 28 years ago to go to the London School of Economics, so another one of your imports from, uh, from outside. Um, my first job was as a computer programmer, and um, I've, I had always had an enthusiasm for technology, but my first job out of, uh, after my MSc at the London School of Economics was uh, as a programmer, programming big databases. But I enjoyed that very much. Mm -hmm. It opened up my eyes to how things worked, and uh, it was my first real, real job. And although it was for a big company, it was helping people do things and quite entrepreneurial in its uh, in its nature. When I was at the um, LSE doing my degree, I met a serial entrepreneur who told me I was an entrepreneur. I was unaware of that fact at the time, and I thought I didn't even I'd never heard of an entrepreneur. My father was an engineer, my mother was a civil servant, and I'd never met one. And he said, "You are totally an entrepreneur." I went, Oh, interesting, okay, um, fine. And he went, you obviously don't yet think you're an entrepreneur, but you will someday think that. And when you do, you come back and you talk to me. Um, so I lodged that in my brain and about six years later, decided that I had, uh, I decided that I was an entrepreneur or it had become increasingly clear to me after that that I was. Um, an entrepreneur to me is somebody who um, wants to make the world a better place and find some problems that they want to solve and they form teams with other like-minded people to solve those problems. And, after six years of sort of thinking what I might want to do, it's clear that I was an entrepreneur. So I went back to this guy who by then was living back in Philadelphia and I said, oh, I've got my idea. And he went, great, what is it? And he funded it, hardly asked a question. Um, and that was great. And he did very well out of the flotation, which was about seven years after we, uh, after he invested in my uh, company that I took, took to him. That idea was, in, uh, was III or Interactive Investor, which was a large database for retail investors to make it easier for them to make decisions around personal finance. So whether or not it was how you buy a house or uh, what kind of ISA you needed or what kind of mortgage you needed or how you buy and sell shares and track those shares. I was thinking about buying a house and oh, it was so backwards, the processes that you needed to go through. And I just thought, well, why am I getting like actual real brochures? And you know, it's, it was just insane. It was so offline. I thought, well, it needs to be online. It'd be so much better if it were online. So instead of buying a house, I took the money that I would have put into buying a house and put it into starting up a company that allowed people to find mortgages online and find ways to make savings so that they can make investments in these sorts of things. I wasn't frightened. I'd been involved in startups. This, is, this would have been the second startup. My first one was tagging on the coat on the coattails of a founder. I was one of the you know one of the earlier employees, but I knew it could be done. And what's more, I thought I could do it and I didn't think it was impossible and I knew the market was huge. It was a big problem to solve. I'd love to talk to you about the Cambridge cluster map and how that came about because that's a, it, I, I love, it's a good story I think, but also Founders for Schools because I talked about giving, giving back but one of the things that I think is most important is that founders of tech companies go into schools and talk to the students and let them understand what it's like to be an entrepreneur. 54% of all of the jobs created in our economy in the last 10 years are created by 6% of companies and the people who create those companies are entrepreneurs. So, you know, more than half of the jobs are coming from these teeny tiny companies, so students should be aware of where they might get a job. And also, I think more importantly to that, how they can contribute to the economy and to fixing all of the problems that there are in the world because we're depending on them to create the companies that will make our world work. 40% of all of the companies in the world didn't exist 30 years ago. They were created by the people who are in school today. Um, I don't believe that the career choices, choice of entrepreneur or founder are really clearly understood or let's say marketed or made, made available to the, um, to the children necessarily by teachers, perhaps because teachers haven't met entrepreneurs. I think going back to my own story, I've not even heard the word before I was 21 of entrepreneur, let alone thought that it might be for me. But trying to get our, you know, the entrepreneurs into classrooms so that they, the students can understand that it's a, it's a great way of, you know, it's a great career. I think it's, you know, for many, the most high impact career imaginable. You can achieve phenomenal things if you choose this if you, as your path. So Founders for Schools, we've just um, started it up and it's a technology platform to enable teachers to invite tech people like you and I into their classrooms to talk to their kids. They give a short talk, 10 minutes, and then they go down with the kids and they talk them through what it's like to be an entrepreneur. And then they go. 
and 96% of the kids um, said that they were inspired by it. 87% of the kids said that they wanted to start up their own business or join a startup. 54% of the kids changed the subjects that they studied to STEM subjects. Now the national average is either 18% or 26% that choose STEM subjects. 87% um, of the startups say their number one problem is finding people who understand STEM. So the fact that one session with three or four entrepreneurs can suddenly create, you know, change double, double or treble the percentage of the kids who are interested because they can see why studying STEM might matter, might help them, might help the world, um, they're inspired, free for the teachers. And it's an hour of the founder and the entrepreneur's time to go in and talk to kids around where they live, or where they work, or where they grew up. I love the UK tech community. Um, been a, a member of it for a long, well, since even before it was really a community. Um, and love the way it's developing. I think it's coming together really, really nicely. But it's here, it's brilliant. Um, it is a close-knit community. I like the development of the clusters. The clusters, you know, the conversation around clusters didn't really exist 10 years ago. Um, there are tangible clusters in London and in Oxford and in Cambridge and in Manchester. It's very exciting. Um, I was inspired by what was happening with the Tech City map. Um, which was created by Charles Armstrong around the table. Um, I'm a member of the, the Tech City Advisory um, sort of committee. They said, how many companies are there in Tech City and where are they? And they didn't know. It's like, well, well, let's stick them on a map. So we thought, well, let's approach Charles and say, love what you did on Tech City. Can we do that? But overlay it with employment figures and turnover figures for Cambridge. So suddenly you could act on what the what the companies are so you may say we wanted to give the voice you know we wanted to give the companies that were growing fast a voice um, not only in Cambridge but also in Boston and in Beijing and in Shanghai um, and anywhere anywhere where somebody was looking to do business with a fast-growing company that had a really cool product out of the researchers around the university we wanted them to find those companies more easily and what's more find out what their revenues were, was it whether who their directors were, was it easy to do business with them? We were able to do that because of the integration with Doodell and LinkedIn. And suddenly these guys are on the map everywhere, which is great. It does a service to helping the companies not only just start up, but scale up. They do have more access to talent that has worked that have worked in scaling up companies. There's just the mathematics will tell you that. There's a greater number of companies that have gone beyond startup. If you look at the productivity difference between somebody who's worked at a company as it's grown from 50 employees to 2,000 employees, they will have learned enormous amounts on that journey. And if you've got a person that, say, over the same 10-year period has worked for five startups between 25 and 50 people, what will they have learned? They will learn how to get a company from 25 to 50 people. They will have not witnessed and played a part in getting a company from 50 to 2,000 people. So there are a, greater no a much greater number of companies in the U.S. that can do that. They will not have had to depend on the government for that, although there is quite a lot of government help and particularly in procurement for smaller companies in the, in the U.S. I think every single one of us has a responsibility to try to help, help, the, help the companies, you know, and we I mean, I think of it as a community thing, not of which the government is a part, but not the only part. I think that the university should play a part. I think the big corporates should play a part. I think that all of the advisory firms should play a part. And if there's a company that's growing like Stink here and they need someone, then wherever, you know, whatever talent they need, we should help them get it. I don't know from where, from wherever it happens to be on a global basis, putting the right person in place to help that company achieve its goals. I think is important, but it's everybody's responsibility, not just not, I w not just a, a government responsibility. I think it's every entrepreneur. You have a responsibility. You do. I do. The universities do. The big corporates do. Big corporates should buy more from small companies. So should the government. So should um, so should we all. One is not alone, and there are a lot who um, who are great. Um, should there be more? There absolutely should be more. If I look at the number of computer science graduates or maths graduates and the percentage of them that are women, um, it makes me feel really nervous. There are huge problems that can be solved that actually women may have great sympathy for but might not choose to solve. So I think that our whole economy would be better off if we can utilize that, that part of it. And I also happen to think that tech is 
good for women because it, it's, it's efficient, you don't have to go do FaceTime anywhere, you can utilize the technology and be very efficient and have a, have a great lifestyle as well. It's a shame that there are not more women in, in tech. I think it is quite macho in, in some ways um, and I certainly plan on hoping um, to help make it seem less macho. Um, and I don't know if you are aware of the statistics, but women run businesses are actually very good from an investor's point of view. Uh, women like to mitigate risks, they don't feel comfortable with risks, so they probably, you know, well I guess the, the statistics show that they, um, the ROI is higher. So as an investor I'm very happy to back women. Uh, I think they can spot things, I think they're good at playing on a, on a team often, um, and anything any of us can do to um, to bring more women in tech, the better.